I'd like to start up again. If, if anybody, you know, wants to also ask me an, an email question, I, didn't, I don't know if you have my email. It's ray8, so ray8 at psu.edu. You know, the other thing I, I, I want to mention, I, I, I'm going through, in this class as in the, all the others, we're going through quite a bit of notes. And, and the same thing with a course, you know, if you, in a semester you go through quite a bit of material in a semester. And I, when I was a student, and a lot of professors would tell me is, what do you want to retain after that course? Because you're not going to remember everything. And so, you know, the, the one thing is you want to understand simple concepts. And then what are the little pieces of information that if you retain them, you can understand something, or if somebody asks a question, you can try to come up with an answer on your feet. So, you know, when I, when I took combustion, and we were studying premixed flames. I took the course from Professor Irv Glassman here, and I can remember him telling me, well, the most important thing, if you leave here and remember, is that the laminar flame speed is proportional to the square root of the thermal diffusivity times the reaction rate. And if I know that, I can tell you how the pressure is going to affect the laminar flame speed, because I know how it affects the thermal diffusivity, because I can write it out as K over rho C sub P. And I know how pressure can affect the kinetics. I can also tell you how the temperature is going to affect the, 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 the laminar flame speed. I can tell you how adding a diluent to the material. So, you know, knowing that one little piece of knowledge, I, under, I can understand a lot and remember a lot. I don't have to remember all the details. And so, you know, this course has some of those same sort of equations. I've been, you know, telling you about, you know, the square root of the flame temperature over the molecular weight, uh, the burning rate of a repellent goes with some constant times the pressure to the N. What is that N? Well, N looks like just an empirical value. But if we go back to that simple analytical analysis, what it's telling me is really I should write it as N over 2, where N is the reaction order. So if my reaction order is 1, it's P to the half, right? That's an acceptable regression rate for a propellant in a rocket motor. If it's a second order reaction, then I get P to the 1. You know, if it's a purely set, then I'm going to run into problems. So, you know, there's things like that, you know. So I'm, I'm going through a lot of notes here, and I, you know, I don't expect you to, you know, if you haven't had a course in some of these areas, you know, to obviously remember anything. I'm not sure why this is going on and off. Let me log in. Okay. So what I want to do is continue showing you some information about kinetics. So if you haven't had a course that really looked at kinetics and, and hydrocarbon oxidation, I want to give you just some concepts of what people do and what has been done in the propellant field. Okay. So I, I showed you the results of, say, this, ice, this adiabatic constant pressure calculation. And obviously, you know, re using reaction pathway, we can start looking at what happens to the carbon in nitromethane. We can start looking at what happens to the nitrogen in nitromethane as it goes to that sequence of initial nitromethane to final products. And, and I can, in this particular case, I can break it down into the stages, the first stage, the dark zone, and the second stage, okay? And so here you can see, if I'm looking at the carbon, what happens to the carbon, and I'm not going to go through all this detail because it would take too much time, uh, but if I'm looking at nitromethane, remember the weak bond is CN, right, in, in nitromethane. So I'd expect that to break through some sort of thermal decomposition, potentially a collision with a, a, a secondary body that transfers uh, from momentum into kinetic energy internally. I basically put enough energy into the molecule and I'll dissociate the bond. Okay, so it'll come over and then make methyl in terms of the carbon chain. Now one thing can happen is if the NO2, NO2 group hangs around, then the NO2 group can come back and add to the methyl group and form the nitrite, which I show at the top here, CH3ONO. So basically now the O atom added to the carbon. So what's the weak bond now? and the nitrite. It's the O-N bond. So when it comes apart, it's going to form methoxy, the CH3O and NO. Okay? And if it stayed basically as CH3, then the CH3 methyl could have reacted with the NO2 that broke off. And if that happened, I could also form methoxy. If I form methoxy, then I basically follow hydrocarbon chemistry, where now the methoxy, methoxy loses an H atom. I form formaldehyde, 
through abstraction reactions with H and OH, I form the formal radical, and then through basically, uh, if it's a high temperature process through the thermal decomposition, I form carbon monoxide. Okay, and that's what happens in the first stage. So in the first stage, I didn't make any CO2. And you can also then follow what happens to the nitrogen chain in the bottom row. Okay, so I can also now go to the second stage. And what you, if I looked up here, where was some of the carbon going? Some of it was actually forming methane, the methyl radicals H atoms were adding. And so down here, I can sort of follow what happens to the, the methane in the carbon chain. It also forms some methanol, and it goes through in the dark zone and starts to form some hydrogen cyanide, if I'm tracking the carbon. And a very little bit starts going over to form CO2 from the carbon monoxide. And the, the nitrogen chain, I ended up having NO, in the dark zone, it basically forms hydrogen cyanide, uh, which has got to eventually be converted to N2O and, and finally N2. And that chemistry is sort of like uh, uh, a denox chemistry that you might see in a combustion course. Okay, and then if I go to the, the second stage flame following the carbon, uh, if, if I had f formed the hydrogen cyanide, it goes through a similar process as the denox chemistry, I form CO2, and I can follow the nitrogen chain either through the formation of HCN or from the formation of NO, okay? And you can go through this and, and really find out what are the reaction paths that are important. And in this diagram here, the ones that have the heavier lines are basically where most of the conversion occurs. Okay, so that, that was for nitromethane. People have studied double base propellants, and they've gone through and they've developed mechanisms. The early work was to build gas phase reaction mechanisms, okay? And, and how do they deal with the condensed phase? Well, they come up with some empirical measurements. They, they measure through some sort of differential scanning calorimetry experiment or thermal gravimetric analysis experiment how fast the condensed phase disappears, and they might measure what's coming off the surface and then they come up with an empirical expression for what happens at the surface. I know the regression rate at a certain temperature, and I kind of know overall what it forms. And then I feed that into a detailed mechanism for the gas phase. But anyway, if I look at the, the flame structure of a double base propellant, so say nitro cellulose nitroglycerin, I would see this same sort of flame structure, a, a first reaction zone, a dark zone, and then a second stage. And it mainly comes about because I've got NO2 that's forming NO and the NO is not very reactive. How do I get it converted to N2? Okay, and so it, it really requires high temperature and conversion potentially to HCN and N2O to get to that point. So if I, if I look at this double base, this is the, the solid over here, the initial temperature. It's basically being heated up. I get to basically what's referred to here as a solid phase reaction zone. Uh, which is going to transfer into a, maybe a thin melt zone. And so you can see, if I'm looking at the, say, the, an, what looks like a nitrate ester or double base, the R here represents what would be like an alkyl radical, and then I have my nitrate groups. Okay, where's the weak bond in this structure again? It's the ON bond, right, when I have that NO3 group. So it's this bond that's going to break here. And when it breaks, the NO2 comes off, in this sort of dark, in this sort of condensed phase reaction zone, and what's left then is an aldehyde. Okay, and this is what starts then to gasify, and I say there's a potentially what's referred to as a fizz zone where both multiphases exist. Okay, the, some of the gas is being formed, bubbles, uh, and it's the, 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 the liquid is being converted totally to gas. And then I have this first stage reaction in which the NO2 disappears, and it forms NO. And now I get into this beginning of this dark zone. The aldehyde starts to decompose, and I form CO. And now I've got to eventually, in the dark zone, start converting the NO very slowly to N2, but it's not until I get a high enough temperature or some of the intermediates disappear that finally the N2 is formed in the final flame from the conversion of NO to N2. Very characteristic of any, uh, any molecule that has NO2 groups as oxidizers. This is sort of the, 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 what the flame structure is going to look like. 
Okay, so again, if I read what's on the right, preheat zone is heating the propellant occurs without chemical reaction. The solid phase reaction zone, thermal decomposition begins with the CONO2 bond breaking. The fizz zone, the NO2 and aldehydes react with other gaseous species to produce NO, CO, H2, and CO2. The dark induction zone, the slow oxidation reactions of the products uh, form from the fizz zone. The dark zone is considered isothermal with nearly negligible thermal and mass diffusion. And then finally, the, the, the luminous flame zone uh, in which the final products are formed. Okay, so here's some examples of basically that double base propellant burning in the, in, as a function of pressure in the lower left here. So I'm looking at three pressures, one megapascal, two megapascals, and three megapascals. You'll notice the strand at the bottom, it's basically painted red, so that's the inhibitor, okay? And what I see at the very low pressures, right near the surface, you can see some luminosity. That's the first stage reaction, okay? And then I go into my dark zone here, and then here's my second stage reaction out here. As I increase the pressure, the kinetics that occur in the first and second stage are pressure dependent. So the reaction rates are going to increase, right? So now you can see the first stage has sort of gone down into the inhibitor, and you really can't see it because the inhibitor is blocking it. But you can clearly see the dark zone length has got less, and the second stage is moving closer and closer to the first stage. Okay, and, and you see that as I continue to go to higher pressures. If I go to high enough pressure, that second stage is gonna basically land right on the surface. So how that affects the temperature gradient at the surface, remember it's the temperature gradient at the surface that's feeding energy into the condensed phase that's co controlling the reaction rate. So there you can see how the, these gradients are basically changing as a function of pressure. And there's a plot then on the right that shows how thin that dark zone changes, it's it, the dark zone length as a, as a function of pressure. And it basically is saying is if I increase the pressure, the length of that dark zone decreases, okay? But it, you know, you can start to understand sort of the concepts that are why that's occurring. Okay, let me just say a little bit more about the modeling of, of double base propellants and I'll say a little bit about the modeling of, of nitramines. Uh, the condensed phase mechanisms are often neglected due to the lack of their understanding this is starting to improve over the last maybe five years. But early on, like I said, people didn't really understand and didn't know how to model the condensed phase. So in addition to possible vaporization, initial condensed phase decomposition is assumed to occur at, at only at the surface, so there's really, the early modeling didn't account for basically this fizz zone. And a pyrolysis law relates the surface temperature to the rate of reaction. Uh, Zenon, who, who did some early work in this from empirical studies, developed the following pyrolysis law for double base propellants that says, okay, the, the mass evolution rate at the surface is, has an erroneous form as shown here. And he did this from experiments in which he took basically the double base material. And he, like, a typical experiment is a, a, a he could have just hit it with a laser or something where he, where he knew the surface temperature and measured the rate at which the material was disappearing. So it wasn't really a combustion experiment. Other people do it in what's referred to as a thermogravimetric analysis or a differential scanning calorimeter, where they put a little bit of material in this small cup, and what you do is you very slowly start to raise the temperature. And you, you, if, it, if it's a thermogravimetric analysis, you're measuring the weight of that material. So as I raise the temperature, how fast is the mass loss, okay? If it's a, 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 if I'm doing a, a thermal calorimetry experiment, I'm sure trying to measure where the energy release is occurring, at what temperature, okay? So, and from that, you can develop these correlations. So as, and as I mentioned here, various types of thermolysis experiments where the surface is heated in a low temperature and often low pressure gas environment are used to measure the species composition evolving from the surface. And then knowing that information, I write down a global reaction. The original double base goes to these species that I measured coming off the surface at this sort of regression rate that I measured from the surface. The condensed phase of very few simple ingredients such as RDX and a few binary mixtures have been studied. RDX has probably been studied the most. 
and I'll show you some results within the last five years where basically quantum chemistry is now being used to come up with detailed condensed phase models. Detailed gas phase processes, including complex elementary reaction mechanisms, heat transfer, and multi-component diffusion, have been used in one or two dimensions to study the flame structure and burning rate behavior. Uh, I give one example, and, and, and I did put some references in uh, the notes of 10 of some of this work or where you can find it. Uh, the work of Miller and Anderson, who have developed detailed models to study flame structure and predict burning rates of multi-ingredient double base propellants. So here's an example of, of what they might have done then. So they took JA2 propellant, which is a double base propellant uh, that includes nitrocellulose, nitroglycerin, and DEGDN at that, those uh, weight percentages. And then they did a pyrolysis experiment. And at the surface, coming off the surface, they measured the composition of gases that I give you below. So they're making the assumption that's what's coming from pyrolysis from the material in the condensed phase. And they independent use that uh, rate of xenon to give the rate at which it, it's basically coming off the surface, if I know the surface temperature. And then they, they build a detailed gas phase kinetics model based on the type of thing that I showed you for nitromethane, and they predict the burning rate. And this is the sort of results they see then as a function of pressure. They obviously see sort of an AP to the N relationship. Uh, there is a difference where the, the open symbols are some experimental data, and you can see there is a slight variation. And they see some reason, basically, a, what looks like somewhat of a plateau being formed there. Uh, some of the additional uh, comparisons of that model is with measurements of the temperature. OK, so uh, the temperature was measured by NO absorption and OH absorption. And you can see that. The, the flame structure had that multi-stage structure. So in the dark zone, these are the experimental measurements here. And then in the secondary zone, these measurements were made as a, as a crude measurement of the, of the temperature. And you can see here then the, the sort of the model prediction qualitatively getting the right type of results. And then NO was also measured in the dark zone. And you can see it's very slowly, this is on a log plot, but you can see it's very slowly disappearing. And then I get close to the secondary flame zone, and it rapidly disappears. And again, qualitatively, the, the model does a pretty good job of predicting the results. But in real, reality, remember, JA2 doesn't burn as a simple one-dimensional system either. I showed you this picture before. This is what JA2 looks like when it burns. So you know there are a lot of assumptions being made in these simple one-dimensional calculations. And the fact that it does that well is surprising in itself. OK, I, I want to say a little bit about the thermal decomposition of RDX, since that's really the, the molecule that's had the most study in terms of energetic materials. Uh, the question is how it comes apart. Well, there's been different studies that have looked at different mechanisms. Uh, the, the first one is the homolytic cleavage of a nitrogen-nitrogen bond to form the NO2 molecule. Remember what nitromethane looks like. I have this six-member ring with N, 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 C, C, C. Off of each of the ends, I have my NO2 groups. And th this is basically two hydrogens on each of the carbons. So what this is saying is, uh, the weak bond here is the NN bond, potentially. And I have this simple fission reaction then. OK, I could also, I mentioned this one before, concerted decomposition, where the ring opens up simultaneously and it breaks three bonds. OK, and it ends up forming then three methylene nitramine molecules that are shown here. And I could have what's referred to again as this successive Hono elimination to form uh, three HONO molecules and one three five triazine, okay, which is just the ring structure without the NO two groups on it, and some uh, some of the hydrogens. So here, let, let's take a look at what the bond energies tell us under basically high temperature conditions. And I show you the successive bond energies after one has been broke. So if I do a bond energy analysis. I'm going to find, initially, this is the RDX. I'm going to find this is the weakest bond, OK? 
So the NO2 group's going to come off. And then I'm ending up with a radical, right? That ring structure is now a radical. And remember, I said the bond energies change in the structure once it's a radical. And so I've got to go back and reevaluate those. And what I'd find then is the next weakest bond is one bond removed from the radical site, sort of like a beta decision reaction that occurs in hydrocarbons. So this is the next weakest bond. So once that bond breaks, I open up the ring structure. And so now I've got a, a radical here, and the same thing happens. One bond removed. So the next one that's weakest is this one here. And finally, again, one bond removed is this. So this would basically just unzip by breaking one bond removed from the radical site around the ring. And so what I end up with then is initially the NO2 group coming off of it, and then I end up with two of these methylene nitramines, and I end up finally with one H2CN. And I can look at those species themselves and start asking, well, what are the weak bonds there? So if I come back to my methylene nitramine, the weakest bond is going to be, again, the NN bond. It's going to break. I'm going to another, get another NO2, and I'm going to get an H2CN. The weak bond there is going to be my CN, CH bond because uh, of the double bond between the C and the N. So then I end up getting hydrogen cyanide, and the same thing's going to happen here then. Okay, so you can see how that would base, break apart based on the, the bond energies. Okay, and I, I, again, I'm not going to go through the detail, but people have done a lot of quantum mechanical calculations to look at structures, reaction pathways, using density functional theory. Uh, this is a, an example of, of trying to follow the decomposition of RDX by NNO2, which is what we just looked at schematically on, on the previous. And so what you'll find is, it, it, as you go through this re reaction channel process, you can see different intermediates are formed. And by the time I get over to the right, I got three channels that are formed. Okay, the product one channel is the RDX goes to NO2 plus HCN plus methyl nitramine plus uh, yeah, MNH uh, and, and uh, uh, releases a energy of uh, 64.5, well, in this case, it's endothermic that requires that much energy. Okay, so it's endothermic by that much. The second product route is the RDX goes to NO2, two methylene nitramines, and an H2CN group. So this is the structure I showed you previously on the, the previous page. And it was, it's endothermic by 75 kcal. And the last one is where the RDX breaks apart, forms 2NO2, one methyl nitramine, and then the CH2NCHNH compound which is endothermic by 44 kcal per mole. So this, this more detailed analysis would probably say it's going to follow a good percentage of that product group three. If I look at consecutive HONO elimination, uh, so this is where I form these five member rings. So in other words, the, if I look at the structure here, that's going to look like this. What happens is, basically, I form a, a ring structure that involves the transfer of the H atom over to the OH, and I start breaking off HONO molecules. And you can, if you follow the details of the structures here, you can probably see it a little better than I drew it on the right. You end up with two product channels. Uh, the first is basically where the RDX decomposes to form two of these HONO molecules and one methylene nitramine and two hydrogen cyanides. And then the third one is where it forms consecutive HONO elimination to form three HONO molecules and, and three HCN molecules. 
And again, you can look at the energetics of each step, so the product channel two would be favored there. Okay, so anyway, what I'm saying is, at the state we're at right now, people can build very well understanding of, you know, gas phase models. Uh, what's been done in, initially in the, in the condensed phase, well, the, these are, I give three examples of how people have studied the, the condensed phase. Uh, and typically they're done under different heating rates. And the heating rate is very important because you, remember I told you about this thermogravimetric analysis experiment where I slowly heat up the sample? Well, that sample is probably being heated at 10 degrees C per minute. Heating rate's very slow. In a combustion reaction where I have basically a flame sitting above the surface, the heat feedback into the condensed phase is several thousand degrees per minute. Okay, so the, and that different heating rate basically means it's going to bring the surface temperature to a different temperature than if it was being heated slow. Okay, so if I look on the right here, you, you can see a range of experiments that have covered different heating rates. And, and so this simple thermogravimetric analysis, you can see the heating rates are very slow. That would be more representative of what happens if I'm looking at aging or what's referred to as cook-off. You know, if, if the species, if the compound was sitting on the shelf here over a period of time and slowly it, it was evolving, you know, vaporizing some of the ingredients or there was a slow chemical reaction or it was absorbing moisture. And this T-jump experiment, this is something that Tom Brill developed at the University of Delaware. Stefan Tynellis developed it and now Mike Zachariah uses it out in, in California. You can see the heating rates there about 10 to 3rd Kelvin per second. So this is very typical of what you'd see in a flame. Okay, so what this experiment basically consists of, what, what Brill did initially, he took a thin foil metal, okay, and he put a small sample of the material right in the thin foil, and he built an electronic system that would rapidly heat that thin foil up to a high temperature, and then it would hold that temperature for a period of time. And then he'd use FTIR spectroscopy to measure what's coming off the surface right above the sample. Steph Tynell came along, and changed his experiment very little. He now put the sample in a confined volume where he could actually heat it from the top and bottom at a, at a much controlled rate, and he directed the product gases going out a small nozzle then, and then he had an FTI right above that. Mike Zachariah comes along, and he can get even higher heating rates because instead of using a thin film, he uses just a wire and puts a small amount of sample on the wire and basically heats it very quick, and now he has the products going to a mass spec, okay? So he does a different type of diagnostic one. But they do provide detailed information of what's coming off of the surface, what's coming from the condensed phase. Okay, and this last one here would be more of a, even like a detonation almost, uh, is where I heat the sample with a pulse laser. If you do that, this is some of the results that Tom Brill obtained. And so he's looking at it as a function of temperature. And as a function of temperature, it's basically looking at it as a function of heating rate as well. So as I go from low temperatures to high temperatures or heating rates, what he's finding, he's looking at the N2O to NO2 ratio. And you can see at very low temperatures, I'm forming men, more N2O than NO2 coming from the surface. But as I get to higher temperatures or higher heating rates, I now find there's more NO2 than N2O coming from the surface. So the mechanism is changing depending upon the heating rate. Okay, I'm opening up a different channel. Okay, and here in a global form, this is what they postulated as the channels. So in terms of the, the low temperature reaction, this is for HMX or RDX. I've got the, 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 because of the structure, they just form a different amount of products. So in, in the case of HMX, under the, the low heating, low temperature conditions, it was hypothesized that formaldehyde and N2O would form, okay? And this was basically an exothermic reaction, okay? And, and you know, the four or three depends on whether or not it's HMX or RDX. As I increase the heating rate, what basically was postulated was hydrogen cyanide would form and HONO. And HONO is basically a form of NO2 where the NO2 quickly reacted to grab an H atom to form HONO. Okay, so it sort of represents the NO2 that I showed in the, in the previous graphs. 
And again, they can come up with, just like I showed you for the double base, knowing what the products are and knowing how fast the material disappears, they can come up with global reaction rates for those condensed phase reactions. And people have taken those global condensed phase reactions then and added it to detailed mechanisms to predict RDX burning. So in a very similar way as the double base. Now, I want to just show you one thing. Again, this is the most recent work uh, that has come out of Steph Tynell. There's probably only a couple of groups, a few groups in the, in the U.S. that are studying condensed phase chemistry. And this is some work that's been done using quantum chemical calculations with density functional calculations. So they take quite a bit of time, but they unravel quite a bit of the structure. And so what you're seeing here is a number of new channels that they've found through these calculations. So if I look at, this is for RDX here. And you can see I, I'm showing on this basically uh, really two channels. The, the, the first channel is this Hono elimination where I lose basically an NO2 group here and I lose an H atom here. The NO2 group and the H atom come together to eliminate Hono. Okay. And then the earlier results in the gas phase basically